Uh, great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Cyril Udaye, who will talk about the non commutative ergodic theory of lattices in higher rank simple algebraic groups. Okay, Cyril. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and the introduction. I'm very grateful to give a talk at the NCG seminar. And actually, I'm very happy to talk about this um, today. Um, Okay, just let me start before uh, really diving in um, uh, by you know, giving introduction and also motivation for the results I'm about to present today. Sorry, do you want to enlarge the screen maybe? Oh, let me see. Is it better? No? It's same, yeah. But it's, it's the same because for me now it's okay. on my screen, it's full screen actually. That's okay. But, that's uh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, let me check. So I use Adobe uh, Acrobat Reader, so I don't know what I should do. Mm. I, think, I think that's okay. Maybe we should not modify too much because it's kind of risky. Okay. <laughs> uh, hopefully, you can all you know uh, read uh, the screen. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let me just start by some you know, uh, terminology and to just uh, set up notation. So for me here, uh, K would be a, a local field. So it's a non-discrete locally compact field. And uh, so um, uh, G, not ball phase G, but uh, G like this, it's an affine connected algebraic K group. So it's an algebraic group that is connected for the Zeiss key topology and defined over the field K. And so we say that uh, G is semi-simple if it's uh, radical, it's trivial. So the radical is the maximal connected algebraic solvable normal subgroup. And I will say that the group is almost simple. So there is a distinction absolutely or almost K simple. If G is semi-simple and if the only proper normal algebraic subgroups are finite or K-closed subgroups are finite. And I will denote by uh, the rank, so rank K of G, this is the dimension of uh, maximal K-split torus in G. So the example to keep in mind, uh, this is certainly my favorite example, is SLN. So for N at least two, and so SLN is uh, absolutely a most simple uh, connected K group. And the K rank is N minus one. So rather than just uh, the algebraic uh, groups, what I'm really interested in, in the group is the group of K points and its lattices. Uh, so from now on, uh, G will be assumed to have higher rank. So it means that the, the, the K rank is at, at least two, so greater than or equal to two. And I will denote by just G, uh, the locally compact group of K points. So because K is locally compact, then you have, uh, you look at the induced topology on, on G coming from the, the, the field K. And so G becomes a, a locally compact group that is also compactly generated. And in G, I will uh, consider a lattice that I denote by gamma. So a lattice means that it's a discrete subgroup with finite covolume. So it means that on the homogeneous space G mod gamma, you have a G invariant probability measure. So the example to keep in mind, they are basically all of arithmetic nature. So in the case of SLN, then uh, if you vary the field, then you can look at the integer points. So for instance, you can look at SLN Z and SLN R over the reals, over the complex numbers, you can look at SLN Z uh, adjoint uh, root minus one. And for instance, in the field of uh, uh, Laurent series, um, over a finite field, then you can look at SLN of um, the polynomials in T inverse, okay? So here Q is a, a power of a prime and P is a prime. So from now on, just to uh, make everything, you know, a bit smoother, I will just use the notation gamma in G and I will say that gamma in G is a higher ranked lattice. So typically it will mean, you know, this whole setup. Okay, so this is the object I will be interested in. 
And now let me give some motivation for the work I'm about to present. So let's assume that gamma in G is a high rank lattice. And uh, the, the motivation and sort of the starting point of these investigations is uh, uh, a celebrated result, uh, Margulis normal subgroup theorem, that says that whenever you have a normal subgroup in gamma, then you have the dichotomy, either n is small, so meaning finite, and in that case, actually n is contained in the center of gamma, or n is large and it has finite index in gamma. Okay, so it's, a, it's kind of a remarkable result um, of you know, algebraic nature. So the statement is really algebraic, but the proof is not, okay? So Margulis' remarkable strategy uh, is as follows. Assume that N is an infinite normal subgroup. Then you want to show that it has finite index. So you want to show that gamma mod N is a finite group. And so what Margulis does is that he shows two things. First of all, the quotient gamma mod N has property T of Kashdan. So this actually follows from uh, Kashdan's result because in the situation I'm, I'm in, so G is a high rank simple algebraic Lie group. And then automatically G has property T and property T is known to pass to lattices and quotients. So gamma mod N has property T. But on the other hand, Margulis shows that gamma mod N is also amenable, right? And the only discrete group that are both amenable and property T, they are the finite groups, okay? And the amenability part uh, comes from a completely different um, sort of field. So property T is truly really function analysis, say. Eh? And the amenability part really comes from ergodic theory. And it comes, it, it's, it follows from uh, Margulis factor theorem that says the following. So in G, you can consider uh, what's called a minimal parabolic K subgroup. So if G is SLN, I will come back to this later, but if G is SLN, P, this is just the upper triangular subgroup. So you denote again the, the P, the group of K points. And so G mod P, this is the full flag variety. It's a G space, so it, then it's a gamma space. So here G mod P is endowed with its unique uh, G invariant measure class. And Margulis shows that any measurable gamma factor of G mod P, it's necessarily actually a G factor, and then it's isomorphic as a gamma space to G mod Q. Uh, so we have kind of a rigidity result for uh, gamma factors of G mod P. And using this result, then it's not difficult to um, prove that this uh, quotient group gamma mod N is amenable. I will not do it, but, uh, but it follows actually rather easily. So the goals of my talk actually will be to sort of uh, present extensions and non-commutative analog of both the normal subgroup theorem and also the factor uh, theorem. And what I want to do today is sort of present a new framework to uh, study higher rank lattices using operator algebras. And when I say operator algebras, I mean both sister algebras and Feynman algebras, because we will see that the two are really intertwined. So among the questions we want to uh, um, discuss are first of all, the discuss the point stabilizer for ergodic and minimal actions of gamma on spaces X. So this first item, it's still commutative. And then the last, the, the other three items are really non-commutative. So for instance, I, we will discuss the structure of sister algebras associated with unitary representations. And what I mean by structure is uh, simplicity or unique trace property for these sister algebras. We will be also interested in the dynamical properties of the affine action of gamma on its convex space of uh, positive definite functions. And last but not least, we will be also interested in uh, rigidity aspects of the group fundamental algebra of the high rank lattice. And I will make a connection with a, a celebrated conjecture by Anna Kohn. So my talk is based on two joint works. Uh, so the first one with uh, uh, Rémi Boutonnet, 
So we started all this uh, in 2019. And also more recent work with uh, Uri Bader and Rémi Boutonnet uh, that sort of extends what we did with uh, Rémi. So I will come back to this, but it's fair to say that with Rémi, we sort of launched this whole thing and we uh, considered lattices in real Lie groups. And with Uri and Rémi, then we extended those results to uh, deal with lattices in algebraic groups defined over arbitrary local fields. Okay, so let me just uh, start with the, let's, let, let me now dive in the topic and um, explain what's the main results, what behind actually all the applications uh, we are uh, uh, looking for. So this is what we call the non-commutative neural Zimmer theorem. And before uh, stating the result, um, I need to introduce a little bit of, uh, of, of notation and, and terminology. So the space G mod P has already appeared before in the statement of uh, Margulis factor theorem. And it plays a, a key role in all this analysis. And in a way G mod P is what we call the boundary. So as before, uh, G is an algebraic group, a uh, simple algebraic group with a higher rank. And P is the minimal parabolic K subgroup. So then uh, G mod P, this is the full flag variety. And as I said, if G is SLN, you can just take P to be the subgroup of upper triangular matrices, for instance. And there is this fundamental result uh, that was um, proved by Furstenberg in 62, and then generalized more recently uh, by Bader and Shalom. And the statement says the following. So whenever you take a nice probability measure on G, so an admissible probability measure, to simplify, just take, say, mu to be equivalent to the R measure, then there exists a unique mu stationary probability measure on G mod P. So uh, mu stationary measure, this is a measure that is invariant under convolution by mu. So it's not an invariant measure, but invariant under convolution by mu. And the compact space G mod P endowed with the stationary measure becomes what we call the G mu Poisson boundary. So what is this thing? The G mu Poisson boundary, this is basically the unique stationary space for which when you look at L infinity function on the space, this becomes isomorphic in a G equivalent way to the space of right mu harmonic functions on G. So usually, Whenever you have a stationary measure on the space, you have a canonical map from L infinity of this space to the space of harmonic functions. This map is called the Poisson transform. In general, it's not, it's not subjective, it's not injective, but there is one space uh, that is of interest here. This is precisely the Poisson boundary for which this Poisson transform is really injective and subjective. So it's uh, an isometry. And we have this, um, this nice isomorphism. So this is what I mean by uh, uh, a boundary. So this is really a probabilistic object, right? An ergodic theoretic object. So this actually uh, will not necessarily play a role in, in the statement, but just for the, you know, the understanding, uh, it's important to, um, to just you know, uh, say what it is. What I want to do now is to define the notion of uh, a boundary structure on, on a fundamental algebra. So what is this thing? Again, I will stick to the very specific uh, setup of high rank lattices. So we take such a lattice and we consider, we take any fundamental algebra, most of the time with a separable pre-draw, and we take any action of gamma on M by automorphism, okay? Then we define the boundary structure as follows. A boundary structure or gamma boundary structure, this is just a normal unital positive linear map from M to L infinity of G mod P that is gamma equivalent. Okay, so on M you have the gamma action and on G mod P you have the G action. So then you have the gamma action by restriction 
And I want this UCP map, this unital map to be equivalent with respect to the actions. So I will give examples in a minute. So this is actually something that is extremely natural to consider. I want to mention that this, this notion is, um, is, is more general than the notion of a stationary state on a fundamental algebra. And this framework actually is nice because it passes to, I mean, it's well adapted to induction. So induction, this is something that appears all the time uh, in ergodic theory of uh, lattices and Lie groups, we always induce. And this, this setup actually, it's also very nice to, uh, to, for the induction operation. So we can very easily induce uh, boundary structures. I, I guess you could, uh, I mean, uh, this map, because they go to something a billion, they are completely positive also, or? Yes, they are automatically completely positive, yes. Yeah, they are yeah. UCP map, indeed, yes. Thank you, Juana. Okay. Um, another notion that I want to uh, recall, this is the notion of ergodicity. So ergodicity on a space means that the only invariant sets have a measure zero or one. And at the fundamental algebraic level, it means that the action is ergodic if the only element that are invariant under the action are just the scalars, okay? So this is ergodicity. Now let me just give example of uh, boundary structures. Um, first, because, because P is an amenable subgroup, uh, the action gamma on G mod P, this is an amenable action and also it's ergodic. Again, G mod P is, endowed with its canonical and unique G invariant measure class. I do want to mention that G mod P is a Poisson boundary for G, but in general, G mod P need not be a Poisson boundary for gamma, okay? So this is, you know, just a technical point, but um, it is not necessary for what we are going to, to do today, but we do need the fact that G mod P is amenable in ergodic, that, that's for sure. Okay, so how can we naturally construct uh, boundary structures? Actually, we do it, you know, using sister algebras. So let's take A to be any unital uh, separable sister algebra and consider gamma an action on A again by uh, automorphism. So because the action of gamma on G mod P is amenable, uh, if you consider the convex compact set of all states on A, so this is a, a separable, metrizable, you know, a convex compact set, then the fact that the action is amenable means that there exists in particular um, a measurable gamma equivariant map from G mod P to the state space of A, right? This is really natural. So if a group is amenable, then any action on a compact, you know, convex set, there is a fixed point. Here, a minable action means that there exists an equivalent map, okay? So wait, wait a is... second, when you say, when you say um, the convex, uh, I mean, which topology do you set? Do you take on the uh, weak star? Yeah, weak star. Oh, oh the weak star, okay. okay weak star okay. topology, yes, yes. Weak star That's why I'm taking a, a C star algebra, yeah, yeah. unital separable oh, okay. C star algebra, yes. Yeah. Oh, weak okay. star topology, yes. Okay, weak star topology, of course, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, you know, people in ergodic theory, they usually call this the boundary map, right? But then by duality, um, in operator algebras, we like to view, you know, things the other way around and we like to view, you know, uh, function spaces. So then we can reverse, you know, things and look at this boundary map really as a UCP map, a unital positive map from the sister algebra A to n infinity of G mod P. Let me denote this unital map by capital E. And the formula, you know, is given extremely naturally by capital E at the point B, this is just the state beta B. Of course, this is almost everywhere. And we can, you know, for every A or for almost every B, we can just, you know, uh, don't worry too much about, you know, the order because a is separable in norm, so there is no, no problem. Okay, so a boundary map, measurable boundary map from G mod P to state space, I can view it as a UCB map 
from A to L infinity of G mod P, and this Swiss map is gamma equivariant. This is not yet the framework I'm looking at because I define this in for fundamental algebras. But then what you do is that, well, you consider the normal extension of this USP map to the bijoule of A. Of course, this fundamental algebra is huge, right? But then what we can do is denote by Z the central support of this uh, USP map. And then we denote by M the corner of the bijoul with respect to this projection Z. And then now M is um, uh, a separable prejoul. And I denote by theta the restriction of the UCP map to this nice separable corner. I mean, separable prejoul. And there you go. Then you have a gamma boundary restriction. So you have a normal gamma uh, UCP map. And we will look at this construction, we'll use this construction in, in two different situations, one commutative, one non-commutative. The commutative setup will be, okay, we start with a compact metrizable space X and a gamma action on X by homeomorphism. Then of course, this gives me an action by automorphism on the sister algebra of continuous function on X. And the other setup, which is this time non-commutative is that take a unitary representation of gamma and look at the C-star algebra generated by this representation. This is the one I call by uh, C-star pi of gamma. And then because C-star pi of gamma is not commutative, then it's interesting to look at the inner action, you know, action by inner automorphism. Okay, so we have this natural, you know, inner dynamical system. And so this is the conjugation action, and this is the one I will be uh, interested in. And then we can apply you know, the above construction uh, in these two situations. Okay, so we get nice examples of uh, boundary instructions. Okay, so now let me state the main, uh, the, the main result. So this is what we call the non-commutative Nevot Zimmer theorem, and I will explain why we call it the non-commutative Nevot Zimmer theorem. So the setup is as follows. So let's take again gamma to be a high rank lattice. M is a fundamental algebra with separable prejoule, and take an ergodic action of gamma on M, and take any boundary structure. I insist that the boundary structure, this is really part of the data, right? So we assume that there exists a boundary structure. And so our theorem says we have the following uh, strong dichotomy. So either the boundary structure is actually trivial, so it sends m to the scalars. So then it means that in particular, we have an invariant state on m, okay? Or if theta is not invariant, then it's not invariant for a very good reason. It's because inside M, we can find a nice projective space. So there is a proper parabolic subgroup. So a subgroup Q, which is different from G that contains P, it may be equal to P. And there is a, a gamma equivalent normal embedding. So a star homomorphism from L infinity of G mod Q inside M and this embedding is such that when I compose this embedding with uh, the UCP map theta, I get a map from L infinity of G mod Q to L infinity of G mod P, which is normal and equivariant. And this actually is the canonical inclusion. What I mean by canonical inclusion, I really mean that the inclusion coming from the factor map from G mod P to G mod Q. Okay, so either it's invariant or it's not invariant, and then the UCP map has a non-trivial, say, multiplicative domain, which is given by some L infinity of, of G mod Q. So in the case when uh, M is a billion, so L infinity of X, and uh, K is the reals, and rather considering actually G actions rather than uh, gamma actions, actually the above theorem was uh, proven by Nevo and Zimmer in 2000. 
of course, they didn't state it using UCP map. They were stating using um, stationary measures, but the formulation is actually equivalent for G actions. But they, they didn't have the result for gamma actions, actually. And then uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Remy, 2019, we extending the devout zimmer theorem to arbitrary non-commutative uh, Fonemann algebra M, and also to gamma actions, to both actually G, action, G actions and gamma actions. And recently, as I said, with uh, Remy and uh, with Uri and Remy, we further extended this uh, NC devout zimmer theorem, this time to deal with lattices in algebraic group defines, defined over uh, local fields. Okay, so this is the this is the main theorem, and I want now to just uh, give and explain, you know, uh, sort of uh, applications. But before doing so, let me just spend one slide about the strategy of the proof. I will not, of course, go into the proof, but just uh, explain, you know, how how it goes. So as I said, uh, a command technique is to induce. So in fact, this theorem, we, there is an equivalent statement where you consider G action rather than gamma action. This is basically using induction and then disintegration. So then we can assume that we have an ergodic G phenomenal algebra uh, script M, and we have a G boundary structure. So a G equivalent unital a normal map from M to L infinity of G mod P. And so the, the main part of the proof is to show that if theta is not invariant, then actually we construct a G invariant a billion Fonemann subalgebra, such that the restriction of the UCP map to this a billion part is non-trivial. Of course, this is the hard part, right? So this is really, you know, where uh, we need to work. Um, so the proof actually combines um, the, some techniques by Nevo and Zimmer, but also some, some, some things really um, uh, specific to uh, fundamental algebras. And we really sort of need to embrace uh, non-commutativity. And we really use at some point, you know, factoriality. And what I want to say is that non-commutative, of course, uh, gives uh, ergodicity. Because when you have a factor, uh, the, the action of the unitary group on this factor is, is ergodic, right? So non-commutativity produces ergodicity. And this is what we exploit uh, using the, the gay Cadison's uh, splitting theorem. And moreover, what we show is that this abelian uh, fundamental algebra is, is, is even nicer because if you are now you write it as L infinity of uh, um, standard probability space uh, Z. Then we also show that the, the action of G on Z has actually a large stabilizers. So stabilizers have positive dimension. They are not necessarily algebraic, but they, they contain you know, a, a non-trivial k-split torus anyway. And, and then we use a more standard recipe. We use sort of the tension that we have between algebraic geometry and ergodic theory. And this way, we can produce um, a parabolic subgroup, so non uh, a non-trivial parabolic subgroup, a proper parabolic subgroup, such that Z will quotient onto uh, G mod Q. And then again, reversing arrows, we have an embedding of N infinity of G mod Q inside M. And this part uses, sort of generalizes the nevo zimmers uh, Gauss map trick, anyway. I will not say more about the proof. I just now want to discuss some, some applications. Uh, the first one, as I said, is, um, is a commutative application. Uh, it's a dichotomy result for topological dynamics. And actually, this one is um, a topological analog of uh, Stuckenzimmer's stabilizer rigidity theorem. So Stuckenzimmer in 92, they showed that actions of high rank lattices so actions that preserve a probability measure and that are ergodic. So either 
the, the, the space is finite or the action is essentially free. So almost all stabilizers are trivial. So here we prove a sort of a topological analog of this. And the result is as follows. So let me state it in a slightly, um, uh, assuming that the, the ambient group has a trivial center. Uh, so take any minimal action on a compact metrizable space. So then you have a similar dichotomy. So either the compact space X is finite or the action is topologically free. So topologically free means one of the equivalent definition is to say that any non-trivial element in the group, if you look at the set of fixed points, so this is a closed set because the action is by homomorphism and this closed set has empty interior. Okay. Another way to say it is that um, um, you have a, a G delta dense uh, set of points in X such that the, the stabilizer is trivial. And this in particular gave uh, a positive answer to a question raised by Glaster and Weiss uh, in 2014, related to the notion of a URS, a uniformly recurrent subgroup on the space of a subgroup of gamma. So this space of subgroup of gamma actually will uh, come up uh, in, in a few slides. So this is all, this is sort of the commutative application of our of our result. Um, and, and to prove it, actually, we we sort of uh, use the, 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 the Nevot Zimmer theorem, non-commutative Nevot Zimmer theorem, and we apply it to the boundary structure coming, you know, from the action of gamma on the commutative sister algebra. The second topic I want to discuss is the, the dynamics of uh, positive definite functions. Um, so just let me uh, recall a few things. So here lambda is any countable discrete group, not just to be confused with, uh, with gamma. Let, let me do a slide a bit more uh, in an abstract way. So here script P of lambda, this is the set of normalized positive definite functions. So by normalized, I mean that phi of the identity in the group is equal to one. Okay. So then I can view the, the space uh, P of lambda as a, as a, as a weak star compact, compact convex set uh, in L infinity of, of lambda. Okay. So by the way, a positive definite function, it's if you want, it's a coefficient of a unitary representation. And there is a canonical choice of a unitary representation. This is called the GNS representation. So it's a triple. And P phi, this is a unitary representation. And Xi phi is um, a cyclic unit vector. And phi is given really, it's the coefficient of, of, of pi with respect to Xi, basically. But then, Gamma acts on itself by uh, conjugation. And this induces an action by conjugation of lambda on the space of positive definite functions. Okay. So this is an affine action. And a fixed point for this affine action is what we call a character. So some people call this a trace, which is okay. I call it a character sometimes. Uh, people use the word character to say it's an extremal trace, but I will just say character. And uh, so we have the space of, of characters. And so the space of characters, this is a compact uh, uh, convex subset. So it's closed in the space of positive definite functions. So this is abstract. So let me give you uh, examples. So one way to consider example is to look at the, um, the space of all subgroups of lambda. So the so you have lambda, which is countable discrete, and you can of course view a subgroup as its um, indicator function. And so the, the space of subgroups you can endow it with the Shabuti topology. And actually here in the discrete setting, this is just a closed subset of two to the lambda. So the power set of, of lambda. And the space of subgroups is endowed with the conjugation action. 
And then you have a map from subgroup of lambda to positive definite function that sends h to the indicator function. So this indicator function is indeed a positive definite function and it's associated GNS representation. This is just a quasi regular representation, gamma mod uh, lambda mod h, sorry. And so this map is equivariant and it's continuous. Okay, so we can view really subgroups of uh, lambda as positive definite functions. And then what about characters? So in fact, this for this map, the indicator function is a, a character if and only if the group is normal. Okay, so. And, um, and then you have always at least two characters on the group. You always have uh, the trivial character, just constant function equal to one. And then you have the direct mass at the identity, and this is called the regular character, which gives the regular, the left regular representation. So you, on a discrete group, you always have at least two characters. Uh, coming from, so this is coming from groups. Now coming from uh, group actions on measure spaces. Whenever you have a probability measure preserving action on a standard probability space, you can consider the map that sends a gamma to the measure of the fixed points under gamma. So that's all the time this is positive definite and it's precisely a character when the action is probability measure preserving. And what does it mean for this character to be the Dirac mass at the identity? It means exactly that the action is essentially free. So for any non-trivial element, the measure of fixed points is zero. And of course you have the classical example, whenever you have a finite dimensional unitary representation, of course you have the trace on, matri on matrices and composing the trace with this unitary representation, then you get a character. Okay, so you have really um, these canonical examples of, of characters. And then the question is, um, are these, you know, all the characters that we can get on, on gamma, basically? And for higher rank lattices, the, 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 the answer is yes. And, and, and moreover, we have the following theorem. So this, is, this theorem is also a consequence of the uh, non-commutative Nevold-Zimmer theorem. And it, 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 it does two things. It's about existence and classification of characters. So the first item, it's really about existence. So it's, it's like a fixed point property, a bit similar to amenability. But of course, high rank lattices, they are not amenable, right? But here for any uh, non-empty non, non uh, gamma invariant weak star closed convex subset uh, C in the space of positive definite function, in any convex subset that is invariant, you can always find a fixed point. There is always a character. This is a really fixed point product. And then what can we say about the characters? Well, then the group is what we call uh, character rigid, meaning that any uh, extremal character, so a character that cannot be written as a, a non-trivial convex combination of two other characters. Well, for any extremal characters, either it is supported on the center of the group, or the GNS representation is finite dimensional. And you see that the second item, when you apply it to a character coming from uh, a normal subgroup, it's really a generalization of uh, Margulis normal subgroup theorem, okay? And so our theorem strengthens a result by, uh, as I said, Margulis, uh, Stuximer, because we can apply this to characters coming from uh, PMP actions. But also it generalizes the result by uh, Becker about character rigidity for SLN and also results by Craig Peterson and N. Peterson. And now when we combine uh, at the same time the existence and the classification of characters, then we can say uh, something interesting about uh, group sister algebras. 
So this is where we apply this, you know, to the second example of, you know, a nice boundary structures. So if uh, pi is a unitary representation, then you have the C star algebra generated by the, the representation, uh, C star pi of gamma. So you have the state space of the C star algebra. And of course you can view this, the state space of the C star algebra, you can embed it into positive definite function on gamma. Just you, you pre-compose by the unitary, represent, unitary representation pi. And so this is a gamma invariant uh, convex subset. And so in particular, applying the, the, um, the previous results, we get that for any unitary representation of a high rank lattice, this C star algebra, C star pi of, of gamma, always admits a trace, okay? There is at least one character. Let me ask a question about this trace. So, I mean, can you describe the trace directly from the representation in some way? Um, so it's just, so in general, it's just an existence result. But once you know we have uh, that, and this is actually the next, <laughs> the next, um, that was a pose. So that's my, my next, you know, uh, uh, result. Yeah. So for instance, assume that the, the, the ambient group has a trivial center. So mm -hmm. the group also has trivial center. Now assume that the representation is weakly mixing. So meaning that pi does not contain any uh, non-zero finite dimensional representation. Then we show that automatically pi weakly contains the left regular representation. So if you want the left regular representation is kind of a minimum among all weakly mixing representation with respect to weak containment. Mm -hmm. And this gives you, as you said, this, this gives you the explicit formula for the trace. Because you see, you have now a quotient map from C star pi to C star lambda. Okay. Of course, C star lambda, you have the trace. And the yeah. only trace that you have is the one coming from this homomorphism. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, I see. But uh, let me ask then a stupid question. I mean, if I would take the weak closure of C star pi, uh, would the trace extend to that or not? In general, no. No, in general, no. no. That's, yeah. that's, no, no, no. That's, no. that's, uh, so okay. it, it doesn't mean that, yes, I, I know what you are referring to. It, it doesn't mean yeah. that the representation is traceable. No. No, no, it doesn't mean at all. No, 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 but I, I, no, but not even traceable. I was wondering whether there was a weak closure without the trace. Yeah, yeah. In general, no. no. It will not extend. Okay. Um, so then what we have is that the, um, so we have then on C star pi, in that case, if it's weakly mixing, then we have a unique trace. Actually, we prove that we have the unique trace, which is the one given by the formula. Mm -hmm. And C star pi, of course, it's not simple because there is a quotient, but the kernel of this uh, star homomorphism, actually, this is the unique uh, maximal proper idea. So it's uh -huh. not simple, but we can say something at least about the structure of the ideal. Mm -hmm. And this relates actually to um, results about C star simplicity and the unique trace property for the reduced C star algebra. Mm -hmm. And somehow this, this theorem, it's generalization of that, but to say arbitrary uh, weakly mixing representations. So this is what this uh, result means. Okay, so now I want to uh, focus and this is the last topic. I want to make a connection with a, a celebrated conjecture by uh, Alain about uh, uh, high rank lattices. So Lacombe showed that uh, whenever lambda is an ICC group with uh, property T, infinite ICC group with property T, then the, the type two one factor of lambda, L lambda, has at most countable, uh, oh, I forgot. Ah, yes, the symmetry group are at most countable. So it means that the fundamental group is at most countable and also the outer automorphism group. And then Alain conjectured that, in fact, maybe L of lambda actually retains the group lambda, meaning that if you have two property T groups that are ICC that have isomorphic uh, fundamental algebras, then the group should be isomorphic. 
So, by the way, let me mention, and uh, this is a footnote. Uh, very recently, so it was last fall, uh, Kifan, Yoana, Osin, and uh, Son, they actually constructed the first examples of uh, ICC uh, discrete group with property T, which are what we call W star super rigid. So, I, I understand. That. I mean, with respect to the re result of Yoana, Popa, and uh, and uh, Vas, uh, I mean, but they didn't have property T, if I understand. That. That's right. That's right. So they didn't have property T because yeah. their examples, you remember, it was like generalized uh, ref products. Yeah. So, so it was. They do not have T. They don't have property T. I see. So this they was the first T. example of property T. Okay. It's very good. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Yes. So ah. their example actually is it's interesting because they look like ref products. So you yes. have an exact sequence, but it's ah. not, you know, split. Ah. So That's it's not yet. Uh, it's not yet the big step. It's not yet the big step. Yeah, sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> I see. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. No, but it's yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, okay. Um. So of course, I'm um. Personally, I'm more interested in the in the setting of uh, high rank lattices. So, in view of uh, Mosto and Margulis uh, rigidity result, let me state the following version of. Uh, rigidity conjecture. And here I will stick to the framework of um, uh, lattices in uh, real Lie groups. So take uh, say G1 and G2 to be uh, real connected simple Lie groups with a trivial center and real, real rank at least two. And take gamma one and gamma two lattices in G1 and G2. Then assuming that the, the group phenomena algebras are isomorphic, then I strongly believe that G1 and G2, the ambient Lie groups, should be isomorphic. And in particular, their rank uh, should be the same. And so the most to Margulis uh, result says exactly this without L, right? So most to Margulis uh, rigidity uh, result says if gamma one and gamma two are isomorphic as abstract groups, then the ambient Lie groups are isomorphic as Lie groups. So this is the most Margulis uh, theorem. OK, so it's still open. <laughs> but let me, let me say something that is um, uh, meaningful with respect to this conjecture. So again, take a higher rank lattice. Let's come back to the setting that we had before of lattice in uh, simple algebraic groups. Let's assume again that the center of the algebraic group is, is trivial. So remember, we have this ergodic action of gamma on G mod P. This action is essentially free ergodic. And so we look at the group measure space construction, the group measure space phenomenon algebra that I like to denote L of action. So left for the algebra of the action gamma on G mod P. So this action is type three one, okay. So then this this factor by um, the result by Anakon and Ufe Orup. This is the unique. This is isomorphic to the unique Araki Woods factor, okay. Right. So another consequence of the non-commutative neighborhood Zimmer theorem is the following. I would say non-commutative analog of Margulis factor theorem. So let me let me state it to be uh, more clear. So the reason says the following. So you see, you have L gamma, so you have the group phenomenon algebra of the lattice. This is a two-one factor, and this lives inside the group phenomenon algebra of the action of gamma on G mod P. This is an amine, This is the isomorphic to the unique amenable AFD type through one factor. Now the theorem says that whenever you have an arbitrary phenomenon subalgebra in between, mm -hmm. then it comes necessarily from a unique parabolic case of group. Huh. So M is equal to the group <laughs> phenomenon algebra of action on G mod Q. So you see, this is really the non-commutative analog of Margulis result, right? Sure. Really the analog. And the thing is that then, well, it's, you know, there is two to the rank 
intermediate parabolic subgroup between P and Q. This is just, you know, classical result from algebraic groups. And so the corollary is that the inclusion of the group phenomenon algebra inside the group phenomenon algebra of the action then remembers it retains the rank basically right so, so the rank is basically of, the number of intermediate yeah. fundamental subalgebras. yeah so if i understand well i mean if you could define this inclusion as a kind of boundary in a in a conceptual manner you would be done huh? you would have the same yeah indeed yes indeed indeed you're absolutely right yes so this is the and well as i said it it gives hope to, <laughs> to try yeah. to prove that, as Alain said, um, that L gamma should retain the rank. Yeah, I strongly believe. Strongly believe that. Yeah. We are not there yet. Okay. Um, but just let me explain how we can um, uh, prove this theorem, this non commutative uh, factor theorem, using the, the the mother theorem that I stated before. And this will be my uh, last uh, slide. So let's note this uh, for the algebra of the action as a script B, because as Anna said, you know, it's like a non commutative boundary. So let's call it script B naturally. So as I said, since the, since the algebraic group has trivial center, Actually, we can show that L gamma, it's an irreducible mm -hmm. uh, subfactor in B. And so it means that the conjugation action of gamma on B is ergodic. Okay, so we are in business because you see that we have the canonical conditional expectation from B onto L infinity of GMP. This conditional expectation is normal. It's gamma equivalent. And now we take an arbitrary phenomenon algebra in between L gamma and B. And then we consider the boundary structure, just the restriction of the conditional expectation to M. And so there are two, two things to consider. First of all, there is the case where the boundary structure is trivial. So what does it mean? It means that any element X in M then has all its four coefficients in C. And then we can show that this implies that actually M will be equal to L of gamma, okay? Now we assume that uh, the boundary structure is not trivial. And we know that actually there is an embedding of L infinity of G mod Q inside M. But because this embedding it's, when I compose with the expectation, it's the canonical embedding. It means that now M both contains gamma and an infinity of G mod Q. So then it contains the group measure space construction of gamma acting on G mod Q. Okay, so now we have a little bit better. We know that not only M contains L gamma, but now M contains actually a sub, a sub cross product. And now we are done because, uh, because the action of gamma on G mod Q is essentially free. Then we can use a recent result by Suzuki that says, whenever you have a factor map from X to say Y, and the action gamma on Y is essentially free, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between intermediate factors and intermediate fundamental algebras of the cross products. <laughs> but to use this result, we really need to have in M this sub uh, cross product, right? <laughs> And then what we do, yes, and then what we do, we just, you know, up to enlarging, uh, actually up to, no, taking small of Q, can, you know, uh, shrink Q so that really we have equality. So really M is uh, L infinity, is um, the group measure space from the bar of gamma on, on G mod Q. And this was my last slide. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, so so I mean, uh, so let, let me try to come back to what I was saying. So, so in a way, what one is trying to find out is an abstract definition construction of this boundary. I mean, uh, you know, just from the factor by suitably defining uh, its elements and so on, because it, it, okay, I, at the end of the day, it will be unique. So I mean, uh, so it has to be sort of constructed in a, in a conceptual manner. So, but I mean, that's, okay, of course, uh, the, res the result is very striking that, already. Yeah, that's right. So there is um, there is one issue, and this issue actually already appears in in. in Margulis proof of the super rigidity theorem. So yes, the yes, other yes. theorem yeah. is that indeed when you when you start from an isomorphism from gamma one and gamma two, yeah. then using proximality and boundary theory, then you have sort of you can construct a gamma equivalent map from say yes p one yes. mod p one to g yeah, two. Which is very close to what we are looking for because it's a kind of canonical. Absolutely. Uh, association, yes. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. But you see that on, on, on G1 mod P1 and G2 mod P2, you have sort of canonical measures, you know, really in the yeah, sure, 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 invariant sure. measure class. Sure. But when you look at this map from the gamma 1 or gamma 2 viewpoint, then the, the measure that you obtain, the push forward measure, yeah. may be singular, actually. Yeah, with of respect course. To the, of course. You see? Of course. So you cannot compose these maps, and, no. and this, is, this is really an issue. This is really the, the fundamental issue. I understand. This is really an issue, and this is where you know you need to sort of yeah. you have this long detour. And um, sure, of course, this no, is no, what we are trying what, to figure yeah, out. Yeah, no, no, I understand very well. But what, what I mean is that somehow you know, I mean, the, the the optimal proof would be to find a conceptual construction of this boundary. What I mean is that okay, in the case of Margulis, one then manages, you know, one then uses. Things like these buildings and so on, but somehow, okay, what 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 one would really like to like to have is what is this association? Why it's canonical? Why it's so natural and so on? I mean, uh, yeah. Yes, indeed, you are right. And so there, there is there is um, so recently, I think it was done by Cyan Das and Jesse Peterson. Yeah. They constructed uh, Poisson boundaries for two one factors. Yeah, but that's and, exactly what I have in mind, of course. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and, and, and and the parallel, of course, is striking because then you have yeah. a two one factor which is embedded into an amenable factor in an in a reducible exactly. way. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But again, there is a choice of uh, sort of, of the, probability measure on the unit of yes, yes, the yes, two one yes. factor. So okay, 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 okay. So I mean what, what one is, yes. I understand. What one is not really understanding at the time is the choice of the measure. Yes, okay. Okay. That's right, yes. Okay. This is okay. highly sensitive to the choice of the measure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. I see. Yes. So, yes. But maybe there is, you know, a more sort of operator algebraic way to look at this. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. But that, that, is, that is certainly now that mm -hmm. we have this result that is the strategy. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, this result is already extremely striking because I mean it seems that you're not giving so much more <laughs> than the L of gamma. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just right. a, kind of, right. a little more. Yeah. Okay, so I mean so are there other questions or No. Masoud, you don't have any question? No, I, I was thinking about groupoids, but that's uh, that's an obvious. Oh, no, but I mean, I can tell you a story about groupoids because, uh, <laughs> okay. because yeah, I can tell you a story. I mean, the story is that I think it was in 78 when I was in the Congress in Helsinki. And um, of course, you know, I had been extremely impressed by the result of Margulis. And I told Zimmer, why don't you extend Margulis results from groups to groupoids? <laughs> that's what he did. So, <laughs> but I mean, and, and, and the motivation was in fact not so much groupoids, it was the idea of Maki, of virtual groups, which, which at first seems like a very soft idea. If you want, you know, you, when you look at it at, at, at first, you think, okay, well, you know, this is just a game or something. But if you take it seriously, I mean, Zimmer made this fantastic work just by, you know, 
picking the idea of Margulis and extending this idea to virtual groups. And uh, I mean, you know, and it was, of course, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it, it changed the, the landscape completely because then ergodic theory was uh, was coming into play. So, and then, okay, I was, of course, always asking, you know, well, is it possible to extend it to factors? Because, uh, okay, I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, like the natural next step. But well, I, I wouldn't like it if, if uh, you know, it was obtained by some reduction and so on. No, I think it has to reveal some very conceptual construction of a boundary because it's really that. I mean, you know, what is amazing in this case no, of lattice is, is that even though they are not amenable or anything like that, their action on the Furstenberg boundary is uh, amenable and, uh, you know, proximal. It has all these properties. So... So this is what uh, makes them tractable in some way. I mean, you know, really, I mean, it's um, it's the fact that the group G has an enormous solvable subgroup, which is this P, you know, this is, uh, I mean, uh, and then behind the scene, of course, there is all the work of Tietz on parabolic subgroups and all that, which is the generalization of projective geometry. I mean, you know, so, so, I mean, this is a, an amazing landscape somehow, you know, which, uh, would like to to grasp uh, in the case of factors i mean but okay sure. so there is still a lot to explore i agree there is still a lot to explore but uh, i was uh, as i said i was also quite impressed by the result of um, johanna popa and vas on uh, their construction you know of super rigid groups so this means that these groups sure. exist okay might be the lattices are but but these groups exist and this property is is an incredible property of uh, of groups i mean you know the fact that the yes. factor can uh, remember where it's coming from <laughs> this is uh, i mean you know this is uh, so amazing somehow so, and this yes. latest result that you were explaining you know, of September that you can have proper TT, you said that what they were doing was still of the same kind, but somehow they managed to make it proper TT. Eh? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I, I don't know all the details. So I, I, I've seen the talk yeah. and. Um, oh, you you so, listened to the talk, I see. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I've listened to my colleague, uh, Kifan, uh, give a talk yes. uh, yeah. in Sorin's uh, seminar. It's Sorin's um, seminar. And what they do is that, uh, so yes, indeed, they, they, they consider some sort of, you know, rest product like. Uh, oh, group. It's, so it's you a, really it's have. Still you know, rest product like, I see. Yes, yeah, so you, you, yeah. you really have like, you know, it's like the rest products, so you have really an exact sequence, but it's not, you know, it's not split. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have, because it's not split, then you have um, a bit more room, actually, and you. You can actually mm -hmm. obtain, you know, um, property T, property T groups like this. And you then know they are not property T for such groups. I mean, uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. So there is a construction. So there is. Um, <laughs> it uses, you know, um, uh, small cancellation properties. Uh -huh. And so what they do is that uh, from their construction, I think, is that you start from any property T hyperbolic group, and then oh, you, you start can from find. Hyperbolic group. Ah, very good. Yes, yeah. you can find a suitable quotient. I see. It's more or less concrete, but you can find a suitable quotient yeah. such that this group will be W star super rich. I see. So in fact, I mean, you use property T of hyperbolic groups to... Yes, yes. Yeah. and you use, yeah. you know, small cancellation to, you know... Uh, and yeah. then the deformation rigidity part will come from the fact that they are like red products. So you can still, you know, deform and you still have... I mean, you mean you still apply the, the technique of, of, of Sorin, yes, I mean, yes, yeah, yes. basically, I mean, yes, yeah, which is a deformation versus rigidity. So it's, of course, it's, it's, it's very technical. I haven't read the paper, so I don't know, but huh, okay. this is somehow what, what I got from the... Yeah, yeah, from, but that, from, uh, okay, from that's a very beautiful result also, yes, yeah, certainly. Indeed, yes, yes absolutely. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so is the von Neumann algebra rigidity somehow potentially related to the sister algebra rigidity recently by like Rufus Wheeler to Braga. I mean, what they proved is like the sister algebra cross product of any group uh, mm -hmm. with like the, uh, the action on its own stone check compactification. If two algebra like this, like a sister isomorphic, then 
that's if and only if the two groups are isomet uh, quasi isometric. That's like there's no condition on the group. A little bit surprising, uh, but yeah. is there any potential like, relation? I also I don't see any. This this I don't know because you know the stone change of magnification. You know it's it's you know it's it, I don't see it how it relates to this uh, space mm -hmm. G, G mod P, but actually I don't think it's known and the. That's already, I think, a good question. So whether or not the sister algebras of the high rank lattices are isomorphic or not. Uh, and this would be, you know, like sort of the, the, the you know, like a first step. And it's true that actually, I, I truly believe that, to, first of all, to understand the, the action of the lattice on the G mod P, but really as, you know, as an action on by homeomorphism and to understand, you know, this nuclear sister algebra, mm -hmm. and then you know look at its different you know um, completion and trying to understand this. This is the kind of things that um, definitely will play a role in order to understand you know and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. this this inclusion. So maybe there is something like you know maybe there is more things than to understand at the sister algebra level as you suggested yeah. but maybe not i don't see any relation with the stone shift compactification but no. probably with these you know boundaries yeah well, thank you okay. I, mean, I, just, I had one idea if you don't mind uh, Alan, I'm just ask you i mean one idea is there any geometric understanding of rigidity? What does it mean geometrically? You know? Well, okay. I mean, you know, it is this these buildings, and also, um, I mean, no, no, there are many. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, there, there are there are a number of points of different points of view. I mean, of uh, what it means, but uh, well, I mean, it, it's mainly the fact that. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, in higher rank, okay, these geometries are incredibly uh, contrived. I mean, you know, you cannot uh, fool around with it. I mean, you cannot deform or anything like that. So, but okay, I mean, you know, it's um, it's subtle. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, I mean, no, but it's worth, of course, uh, digging into it. I mean, what, what I have in mind is that you know, optimally, I mean, this type of things will come entirely from the factors. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, when you look at it really in a concrete geometric manner, okay, well, then you find out that uh, the geometries are so rigid that it is not that surprising after all, you know. But when you take the structure and you make it uh, more and more, um, how, how to say, linear, like we do with factors and all that, then it is incredibly surprising. I mean, already, you know, the type of result that, that we saw today is, uh, I mean, because you, you have just linearized the thing and uh... mm. so in the context of like topological rigidity non-positive coverage mm. often plays a bigger role yeah sure uh, here sure. here it's, yeah, I, yeah it's not really the case because yeah, yeah. sure yeah here it's more the fact that uh, somehow the geometry gives you all this incredibly rich combinatorial structure mm -hmm. Which is the teeth, teeth buildings and all that. That's which, right. Yeah, you see, which are incredibly uh, uh, contrived. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and you know, many theorems of teeth, for instance, are only true for rank bigger or equal to three. So when you have the teeth buildings and all that, uh, you know mm -hmm. what they are when the rank, it's exactly the similar result as the fact that projective geometry is only known for dimension greater or equal to three, I mean, <laughs> because in dimension two, the very simple axioms of projective geometry, which are in a la in a two points, uh, so two points passes one line, any line contains three points. And if the line A, B and C, D intersect, then the line A, D and B, C intersect. I mean, whom can find simpler axioms than that? You know? <laughs> Nobody. But still, what happens is that in dimension bigger or equal to three, then you have this arc theorem for free. And then you know that the geometry comes from a skew field. Mm. But in dimension two, it's unknown. It's, it's still an open problem. I mean, people don't know what are the, the projective geometries of dimension two. So the two worlds are very, very different. 
Okay, and then one can look for the root of the rigidity. Where is it, you know, and so on. Okay, I mean, I, I'm not really an expert, so I cannot uh, answer, but... Uh, and to but, answer uh, your question, it's true that the, the when Mosto proved this... Yeah, uh, exactly. I was result, thinking of it Mostow, was very of geometric. Very yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. If you look at most of books, I mean, okay, it's entirely geometric. I mean, it's a beautiful yeah. book, by the way. It's really worth looking at it. I mean, yeah, yeah. it has lots of nice computations first of the geometry of the symmetric spaces, yeah. and uh, and a lot of insight indeed. I mean, you know, Ge geometry yeah. means Riemannian geometry too. Right? Yeah, to but I mean, yeah, there yeah, has it more yeah. the combinatorial sense of it. I mean, you know, really. Yeah, yeah. like and quasi so, isometry, but also a god city was already. Of course, it. yeah. yeah. Uh, Ergodicity in was, uh, I mean, Furstenberg, uh, Margulis, you know, all yeah, that. Yeah. And it's amazing, indeed. Yeah. yeah, so, but I mean, it's wonderful that, you know, you are, uh, Cyril, you know, that you are working in that direction. I mean, I really hope yes. to see one day. Yes, I'm, I'm <laughs> thinking about it, you know, a lot. <laughs> so, I will let you know of any progress, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm usually optimistic as a person, so you know, I yeah. I want to believe yet, you know, this is, you know. Yeah, yeah. but uh, Andre Veil said, you know, in order to prove a theorem, you have to be optimistic. So yes, <laughs> you have to be. I, I like. Uh, what, what he said, it, you have to be an optimist in order to prove. Oh yeah, theorem. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Andre Veil. Eh? <laughs> what was his, his, his saying? You know. Yeah, but it gives you know the it gives the appetite somehow. It gives the yeah yeah sure no it gives you the intuition in a way yeah yes. exactly yeah the drive I mean you know absolutely yes the drive exactly yeah drive right, which is fundamental yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, so I don't see any other question. So I think. Thanks, uh, Cyril, for a great talk. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you, a lot. Thank you so much for your invitation. I was very happy to you know to give a talk uh, at the NCG seminar, and um, okay. so thank really you. thank you for inviting me.